Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, today we come in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for what you've already done in this place. God, what an awesome privilege it is to just have your presence here among us. We're gathered together in your name, and here you are in the midst of us, Lord. You inhabit the praises of your people. And so, God, we just welcome you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the wisdom and the vision and the direction of God. As we open your word, we pray, God, that you would open it up to us. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear, hearts that understand. We, may we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, also we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, we love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, also we would approach your throne today about our nation, God. We ask that you give us wise and godly leadership. Lord, on every level, God, we pray that the laws that are passed are just and righteous. Lord, may righteousness exalt this land once again, Father God. And we pray, Father God, for your goodness in our nation, Lord. We praise you and thank you for that. Also, we would remember our brothers and sisters on the East Coast, God, and we pray that you send uh, just your grace, send what provision they have need of, God, and encourage them and rebuild, Lord. And thank you, Father God, for your church being mobilized in that area, Father God, and we just bless them today. God, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said, amen. amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bible out and go with me to Hebrews, the fifth chapter. And today we're continuing our series called The War Between Pride and Humility. This is part number three. And if you missed part number one and two, that's okay. We've got those online for you for free. You can listen to those and catch up. But today's message will also stand alone, and you'll be able to receive from the Word today. Hebrews chapter 5 we came to verse number 5, and we read these words. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 5 says, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he, speaking of God, who said to him, speaking of Jesus, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And we see this great picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, who before the world was ever created, before time began as we know it, was one with the Father. And could have exalted himself, could have taken a position, could have done a, a, a number of things, and yet chose to take the position of humility. And the Bible says that he did not glorify himself. He didn't lift himself up. No, he humbled himself to the will of the Father. Came in the form of a man. Humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. This was an offense to the Jewish mind. And so uh, we see Jesus taking the form of a servant, the lowest form. While he had the privileges and, and could have came on a golden chariot with fire and flames and could have done any number of things, he chose to humble himself, and he's our example. And you and I, as we go through our life, there's this war that goes on on the inside of us between our pride exalting ourself and humility exalting our God. In fact, that was our definition, if you remember, in part number one of pride is pride is self-exaltation. When we start to get self-centered and lift ourselves up, we start to operate in pride. Humility, on the other hand, is God exaltation. When we start to lift up God's will and God's way above our own will and way and totally and utterly depend on Him for everything. When we no longer look to ourselves or look to society or social systems for our direction, but we look to God for His direction and we're dependent on Him for our everything, for our all, now we're operating in true humility. We also said this, that pride is self-centered. It's all about me. The almighty I, remember that old unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. And yet, humility is God-centered. That it's all about God, that we start to focus our lives and wrap our lives around God and His Word and do His will, His way. Last time we were together, we saw the working of humility. So we defined humility. We saw some of the benefits of it in part number one. Part number two, last time we were together, we saw the working of humility. We saw that we have a responsibility in this thing. How does this work? What are we supposed to do? We saw that we have a responsibility to remain humble. We've all been humbled, and I love how Pastor Luke last week reminded us of those times where we've been humbled. Uh, I took a little walk down memory lane and, and remembered some times that I thought, my goodness, that was humbling. I ate that humble pie. And, uh, and so, you know, we've got to remain in that place of humility. It's better to remain humble than to be humbled. We all know that to be true. Also, we have a responsibility to 
to be a servant and not to be served. That even Jesus Christ, though he could have came and he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the King of glory, he could have came and everybody could have bowed down to him and served him and fed him peeled grapes and, you know, waved the palm branches over him to keep him cool and all that kind of stuff. And yet he came and he took on the form of a servant. You remember the example that we saw of him washing his disciples' feet? And think about it for a moment. He even washed the feet of Judas. Think about that for a second. Here's the man that was going to betray him. And yet Jesus kneels down and washes his feet too. Wow, what a humbling experience. And yet we need to take that same attitude of a servant. Finally, we saw that it's our responsibility to submit, to come under the mission and come under the leadership of the Almighty God. That is humbling ourselves and taking that vision, that wisdom, that direction from the Word of God. We see Jesus is our example. We need to stay focused on him. He's the goal. He's the end. If we're going to live a perfect life like him, we've got to do the works that he did. And so we see the example of Jesus. We see his perfect life, and, and we desire that. And so we see the end result. And oftentimes when we see the destination, we get going on the right track. Think about it like this. If we all decided, man, it's such a beautiful day out there, and after church today, uh, we're, we're all going to wait until service is over, the altar call's done, we receive the blessing and prayer, and we walk out of here, the Inland Empire shall be saved, and, and we do that, right? And, right? Yeah. Praise the Lord. And so we all, <laughs> some of you guys are going, why, why is he getting mad? I'm not mad. Praise the Lord. But we all say, right after church, you know, we're going to exit, and, and, and it's such a beautiful day. We want to go to the beach. We want to hear the sound of the, the waves crashing on the shore. We want to feel the mist blowing in our faces. We want to hear the seagulls and the birds chirping, that sort of a thing. And so we walk out, and we see that, you know, there's, there's this long road, and it leads down, and it, and, it, and it keeps going west, and it kind of leads down. And we say, well, okay, that direction, that's where the sun sets, that's, that's the destination. And we take a look around, and we look up, and we see... Up to the north and kind of to the east, we see a mountain range. Now, that's a different destination, and there are roads that lead up to that mountain range. We would be wise enough to know that, hey, we're not going to get on those roads to get to the beach. But rather, we're going to take the road that leads down, the road that leads west. We're going to get on that road, and we're going to head that direction, and we're going to make it to our destination. In our life, if we can see the end result, if we know what the goal is, then we can get on the right road. There are two paths that we're talking about today, pride and humility. And so where do these roads lead? Well, let's take a look at the destinations. First one, let's take a look at is pride, the end destination of pride. Where, where does pride lead to? If we get on that road, where is it going to take us? Well, the end des destination of pride is, is destruction. Destruction. We see that in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 16, if you will. Turn there with me to Proverbs Right after the Psalms, you'll find Proverbs chapter number 16. It's okay to rustle your pages a little bit so the preacher knows that you're turning there in your Bible. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 18. Thank you for all those rustling pages, by the way. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 18 says these words. It says, pride goes before destruction. A lot of times we quote this, we say pride goes before a fall. While that's true, that's not really what the verse is saying here. Look at this. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Wow. Let's, let's break this down a little bit. We see that the road that we're taking, if we get on this road, pride, it's going to lead us to a place of destruction. If I was to ask you today, what do you want at the end of your life? Would you like to fail at the end of your life? You would say no. Would you like your children to fail after you at the end of your... Oh, no, I don't want my children to fail. I want them to succeed. W would you like to end your life with nothing? No, I, I want to have something stored up so that I can pass it on to the next generation. Would you like to have no legacy? No one cares, no one remembers. You'd say, no, I, I want people to cry at my funeral. I want, I, want, I want flowers, and I want people saying that they were a great person. You know, well, I, that's what I want for my life. Would you like to end your life and end up in hell? You would say, absolutely not. I want to go to heaven. And yet we see this verse, it says that the end result of pride is destruction. We don't want to be destroyed. We don't want our works to be destroyed. We don't want our life to be meaningless. We want a life of, person, per, uh, of purpose. We want a life that is successful. We want a life that leaves a legacy. And so oftentimes we see something like that and we say, well, that's the destination. Well, I'm going to stay off that road. Look at the rest of the verse. It says, in a haughty spirit 
before a fall. What does that word haughty mean? We don't use that word often. What does that mean, haughty? Well, it means high. It means lifted up. It means exalted, or it could also mean prideful. So yes, that's where you get that interpretation. Pride goes before the fall. What does that mean? That means that as we get on that road and we start to lift ourselves up, it's almost like we're building our own scaffolding. But we're building it on an uneasy, shifting sand. We're building it on ourselves and on our own works. It's kind of like a deck of cards. You make a little house of cards. Easily that thing can be blown over and it can collapse and fall down. So pride goes before destruction. The road that pride leads to is destruction. And a haughty spirit, when you exalt yourself and start to build yourself up and be self-centered and you start to think how cool you are and how great you are and you start to lift yourself up, there's nothing holding you up there and you're going to fall. We see the examples of this all throughout the wor Word of God. But one that I'd like to point out to you is in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira. You remember the story that the early church had all come together, right? Everybody was supplying for the needs of others. And there was this guy who, who was named the son of encouragement, right? Barnabas. And here Barnabas comes and he sells a property and he lays the sale of the property, the money that he received, he lays it at the apostles' feet. And everybody says, man, that Barnabas, man, I'm so encouraged by that guy. That's why they call him the son of encouragement. I mean, this is the guy that ran off and, and he got a hold of Saul and, and he encouraged him and, and helped him on that road from being Saul to becoming Paul. And so here this Barnabas, man, this guy's just so encouraging. Everybody's looking at Barnabas, and he lays his, his, his money from the sale of his property at the apostles' feet, and everybody's encouraged by this guy. And so Ananias and Sapphira, this couple that's in the church, they see that, and they say, well, that's, that's neat, man, but look, everybody's looking at Barnabas. Look at the attention that's being placed on this guy. I mean, wow. Well, we have some property, and they start to talk to one another, and they say, we want to sell this property, but you know what? We'd like to keep some of the proceeds from that for ourselves, you know? Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with selling a piece of property and keeping some for retirement or for future investments or for daily needs, that sort of a thing, and you want to give an offering out of that. Nothing wrong with that. But when that takes priority of exalting yourself above the things of God, now all of a sudden we've got a problem. And that's what happened in their heart is they devised a scheme. We're going to sell this property. We're going to hold back some for ourselves. We're going to lay the rest at the apostles' feet just like everybody else has been doing. And then they'll think how cool we are. See, they wanted to appear as something that they were not. They wanted to appear as this benevolent, this blessing, and everybody would see them. Oh, look, they did just like Barnabas did. How cool. They're encouraging too. They're cool too. Look at how, how wonderful they are. And they get lifted up in pride in their hearts. And so they do that. They, they devise a scheme. They lied about the sale of the property. They come and lay the money at the apostles' feet. So here's Ananias before Peter. And Peter says, Ananias, why would you lie to the Holy Spirit? You haven't lied to men, but you've lied to God. As soon as these words hit Ananias' ears, bang, he falls down dead. Remember, I said that the road of pride leads to destruction. And a haughty spirit, see, Ananias lifted himself up, elevated himself, comes before a fall. He fell down dead. Right there in front of the apostles. And young men come in, carry his body out and bury him. Sapphira, his wife, comes in later on and, and she walks in and Peter says, Hey, Sapphira, I got a question for you. Is this how much you sold the property for? And she says, Yes, it is. He says, Why have you devised this scheme? He says, Are not the feet of the men who buried your husband at the door? When she hears this, falls down dead right in front of him. See, pride, that road of pride will not get you to the beach. It's going to get you to the wrong location. See, when you get on that road of pride, it leads to destruction. So what about humility? Where does this road of humility lead? Well, the end destination of humility, the Bible tells us, is exaltation. In other words, we could say it like this. The way down is up, and the way up is down. You get that? The way down is up. If we exalt ourselves, we're going to end up falling down. But the way up is down. As we humble ourselves, we will be exalted. So the road up, see, the Bible's full of paradoxes. You, you got to lose your life if you want to gain it. Whatever you try to keep, you will lose. And so we see that the way down is up, and the way up is down. Quite a paradox, but let's take a look at it in the Bible together. James chapter 4, please, right past the book of Hebrews. You get back to the book of Hebrews, go to the next book, book of James. 
We find in James chapter number four, we've already quoted and read this verse throughout the series, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. James chapter four, verse number 10, still talking about humility. James chapter four, verse 10 says this. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Wow. So if we're going to get to this exalted position, if we're going to be lifted up, then the way to do that is to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves the way we want to. Oh, I'm cool. I'm nice. I'm smart. Handsome. I, I, I've got all the money in the world. I've got all the education. And I'm humble too. I've humbled. No, no, no. Not in the eyes of yourself. Not in the eyes of education or social systems. Not in the eyes of man or the political agenda. No, that's not what this is about. Humble yourselves where? In the sight of the Lord. See, it doesn't matter how you look in other people's eyes. Other people may say, well, wait a second. They look arrogant. They look pompous. What are they doing? And yet that to the world may look one way, but to God, if you're doing God's will, God's way, you're humbling yourself. You're coming under that leadership, coming under that authority. You're lowering yourself and not being self-centered. Now you're being God-centered. And hey, I don't care about what education, I don't care about what social systems say. Other people may say, well, that's prideful. Uh-uh. It's about the sight of the Lord. It's about what God sees. God sees your heart. God knows where you're at. God knows what you're doing. And so humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Do God's will, God's way. And look at what it says, and he will lift you up. So you want to get up, you got to go down. you got to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. See, if you exalt yourself, you're going to fall. A haughty spirit comes before a great fall. But humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. As you come under God's will, you do God's will, God's way, and you humble yourself, and, and you do what God has for you. You start getting God-centered in your life. God gets a hold of your life, and then instead of that deck of cards that you had built a scaffolding for that's fallen, now your foundation is the rock of Jesus Christ, and you will not fall. <laughs> Hallelujah. So today, I wanted to give you a couple of living examples of how Humility works. Remember, we're taking a look at the end destination. We're looking at the destination so that we can get on the right road. And today, if we can see some examples from the word of how humility works, I believe it'll help us to get on the right road and we'll make it to our destination. First one for today, living examples of how humility works. First one for today is Jacob. Jacob. Jacob, we see he recognizes his personal value. We're going to describe what that's talking about, but Every time I look at the life of Jacob, I'm encouraged. If you want, start turning with me to the book of Genesis, chapter number 32. Genesis chapter 32, please. And, and I look at the life of Jacob, and, and I just see you, and I see me. What do I mean by that? Well, Jacob was just like all of us. Jacob had struggles. Jacob had victories. Jacob had success, and Jacob had failure. Jacob wrestled through life. In fact, you find Jacob at one point even wrestling with God. And we know in our life there's been times where we haven't understood, we've been confused, we've been going through trials and struggles, and we've ended up wrestling with God. We've ended up going, you know, taking God to the mat, or God took us to the mat, hello. And so we find out that, you know, Jacob, this man, is a lot like us. And as we look into his life, we see ourselves and we see our story as well. We start to identify and we start to see the successes. You know, Jacob had such a heart for God that he just passionately pursued the things of God his entire life. Yes, often questionably early on in his life, we see some of the things that he did and we say, wow, how could God be pleased with that? But God saw through his deeds and even though he reaped what he sowed throughout his lifetime, we see that in his heart, Jacob just had a passionate desire for the things of God. He, he recognized what was really valuable and he went after it. And that's why the Lord speaks in the Bible, and he says, Jacob, I have loved, but his brother Esau, I have hated. That sounds harsh. How could God hate anybody? And yet here, what he's doing is he's showing how much Jacob valued the things of God, that he would go after the blessing so much and desire the blessing so much that he would do anything he could to get a hold of it. And yet Esau despised his birthright, despised the blessing, sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. God says, that's detestable to me. I hate that. And yet, Jacob, I have loved. Here Jacob is. He's traveling. He's about to meet up with his brother. Let me set the stage for you a little bit. Last time Jacob met up with his brother Esau, Esau wanted to kill him because he had tricked 
his father into giving him his blessing. He stole it out from underneath his feet. So Esau was going to kill him. And so Jacob's mom says, hey, you've got to get out of here. Just let the dust settle. You know, let him cool off. And then you can come back after a couple days. It ends up being years, in fact, decades. He leaves and, and, and he's got nothing except a promise from God that God would take care of him. So here Jacob is, and he's coming back. He's about ready to encounter his brother. It's an uncertain situation. He doesn't know if his brother's going to try and kill him or try and kill his family, if he's going to beat him up, if he's going to, you know, what it's going to be like. And so he's concerned, and he's pouring out his heart before the Lord, and he starts to pray. And we read in Genesis chapter number 32, from a heart of deep humility, Genesis chapter 32, verse number 10, it says this. Jacob is praying, and he says these words. He says, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. Notice the position he takes, your servant. Not that God owes him anything. He says, Lord, I am your servant. He takes a position of humility. He goes on to say, for, your, for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. See, Jacob, when he fled from his brother and when he ran to his uncle's house, all he had in his hand was his staff. That was it. He had nothing to his name except that which was in his hand, a staff for travel. He says that the Lord had so blessed him, and as he had passionately pursued the things of God, that God had now made him into two companies. He had so much stuff that he could actually divide into two different camps. God had so prospered him and blessed him with people and possessions and sheep and different livestock that now all of a sudden he's got so much abundance that from a heart of humility he says, Lord, I'm not worthy of any of this. God, I've been a rascal. I haven't always done things right, but Lord, I'm your servant. God, I, I, I'm not worthy of any of this, of all the mercies. God, I should have been dead. My brother should have came and killed me for what I did to him. And yet, God, you've kept me. I could have been a lot worse off. And yet, you've shown me your mercy, but also, God, you've shown me your truth. And yet, Lord, I'm not worthy of it. I'm just your servant. And I, all I had when I came across this Jordan was my staff. And now you've made me two companies. Now, we see that Jacob knew that he was not only worthy, but God had made him valuable. God had added to his life. God had so blessed him. So much so that if you study out the life of Jacob, at the end of his life, he and his family go down into Egypt. You remember about Joseph, how Joseph had become the prime minister of the land of Egypt and really of the known world at that time, distributing the goods to the people. And Jacob goes down and Jacob meets with Pharaoh. And, and, and at the end of his life, not only does his family come and mourn and lament over him, but the elders of the nation of Egypt come and they're there at his funeral, mourning and lamenting Jacob. See, Jacob knew his personal value. He said, no, I'm not worthy, God. But yet, because of that position that he took, because of that humility, now God exalts him. God gives him favor both with God and now with man. See, we're always going after the favor with man. God, I, I need favor with man. God, I, I need this job. I need favor with my boss. God, I need favor with my neighbors or my relatives, God. And yet God is saying, why are you seeking approval and, and favor from men? Humble yourselves and I will lift you up. See, favor starts with favor with God. And then as we get that favor with God, doesn't matter about anybody else. God will take care of that which concerns us. If you have favor with God, God will make sure that you have the favor with man that you need. And that's what this is all about, is humbling ourselves. Living examples of how humility works. Number one, Jacob recognizes his personal value. Second example that we see from the word of God today, if you want to turn back to the New Testament, the book of Matthew, is the centurion. The centurion. He recognizes his position. Also, if you notice up on the overheads, I put the word authority. Oh, we don't have that. Recognizes his position, his authority. Those of you guys in the back, if you could put that up there in parentheses, recognize this position, authority, the centurion. Matthew chapter number eight. Matthew chapter number eight, Jesus is traveling, he's ministering, he's healing the sick, casting out demons, he's teaching. Matthew chapter number eight, we're going to start in verse number five and we'll read through verse number 13 and we'll pull out truths as we go along. Centurion. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 5, starting out, says this. It says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him. Now stop right there and look up at me for a moment. Who is the centurion? Well, we know that a centurion was a member of the Roman army. Now, not only was he a member of the army, he also had a leadership position in the army. Because he was a centurion, you've heard the word century, a hundred years, right? A centurion in the Roman army was a commander or a leader of 100 men. 
So this guy knew what it was like to be an authority. And now here this man is, this centurion. He's a part of the ruling, reigning government over the Jews at this time, over the, the, the nation of Israel. They were the, the uh, conquering, ruling, reigning nation. So this is a leader in the army of the ruling power of authority that's over this nation coming to Jesus. And look at what he's doing, pleading, pleading. He could have came along and he could have said, hey, Jew, I've heard about you. I've heard that you can heal. You come to my house and you heal my servant. He could have taken that position with Jesus. Why? Because, hey, they were the conquering nation. They were the ones that were in authority. And he had a position to do that, and yet he lowers himself and humbles himself and doesn't do that. He pleads with Jesus, pleading with him. Let's read the next verse. It says, saying, Lord, did you get it? Here's a centurion. Here's a Roman centurion. A leader in the army comes and he says to Jesus, Lord, wait. This man had the authority. This man had the position. This man had the power. And yet he speaks to a Jew, somebody who is underneath him, and calls him Lord. See, we read through this stuff so fast, and we recognize Jesus as Lord, and we don't think it's any, any weird thing that someone else would call him Lord in the Bible. And yet, if we put ourselves in the context, here's a man who had authority, who had leadership, who had respect. Probably the Jews trembled when he walked by because he not only had that authority, he also had a sword that he knew how to use and men that would back him up. And so now here he comes and he speaks to Jesus and he pleads with him. He humbles himself and he calls him Lord. Humbles himself under the leadership of Jesus Christ. So he says, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Verse number seven, and Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Well, it didn't take much convincing for Jesus. He's pleading with him. He's begging him, come on, will you come and heal my servant, right? And he's, he's, he's at home, he's sick, and, and I just, you know, he's, he's, you've got to heal him. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. No, we would have stopped right there and said, fantastic, thank you. Oh, my goodness, Jesus, you're the best. Come on, I'll show you where my house is. End of story for us. But it's not the end of story for this man. Let's take a look at his position. Remember, we're talking about he recognizes his position, recognizes his authority. Let's read on. Verse number eight. The centurion answered and said, Lord, once again, submitting himself to the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. What is he doing? I mean, he already had the answer to his prayers. Jesus was going to go to his house and was going to heal his servant. Now it seems like he's working against what he was asking for. Is this guy schizophrenic? Is he bipolar? I mean, what's going on here? Does he not really know what he wants? Is he trying to talk Jesus out of healing his servant now? Did he come to his senses and realize, my goodness, what am I doing? Let's read on. Let's see his reasoning behind what he's doing. Verse number nine, look at what he says. For I also am a man under authority. So he likens what's taking place here to his natural life, the knowledge that he had of the Roman army, the position that he had in the Roman army, now he's applying to his position with Jesus Christ. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. Remember, he's a centurion. He had 100 soldiers under his direct authority. Look at this. I say to this one, go. Everybody say go. go. Oh, come on. You got to play with me today. Everybody say it with some authority. Say go. go. See, a, a Roman centurion wouldn't say, oh, go. No, he'd say, go, right? He'd say it in a deep John Wayne voice, go. Charlton Heston, right? Ben-Hur. You didn't think I knew about that, huh? For I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, once again, we're talking about this man is under authority, and he has people underneath him. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Verse number 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled. And said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. In other words, Jesus just defined something for you and I. Great faith is not demanding things of God. 
Great faith is not going to God and saying, bless God, this is how it's going to be, God, and we demand our way. No, great faith is our prayers, our faith, in a position of humility before God. Did you get a hold of that? If you're going to have great faith before the Lord, yes, you can come boldly. Yes, you can approach the throne. Yes, you can believe God. Yes, you can take his promises at his words, but you've got to do it in a heart of humility, realizing your position with God. What is your position? Well, you're a part of the kingdom of God. What is your position? You're a king's kid. What is your position? He's greater. I'm not. Hello. He, he's the great one. He's the king. I'm his servant. And when he says go, I go. When he says do this, I do it. When he says come, I come. And so when you're going to approach the king and you're going to ask for something, you don't demand it. No, 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 no. You go to the Lord. You bring his word to him and you say, Father, it says in your word, by your stripes I was healed. It says that, God, you are the God who gives me the power to get wealth that you may establish your covenant on the earth. So you bring that to him and you humble yourself. You come in submission to the word of God and then God moves on your behalf. See, there's been times I know in my personal life that I've approached God with pride in my heart and almost tried to talk him into my prayer request. You know, now I know none of you have ever done that in this room. You've never tried to talk God into to, to doing what you want him to do, you know. But I have. And I know that there have been times where I've pleaded with God and I've approached God and I've wanted God to do something and I've tried to talk him into my will, my way, you know, Lord, if it could just happen, you know, I want this to happen, but God, I want it to happen this way, you know. And then, and then all of a sudden I, I, I include other people, you know, and, you know, because everybody else will be blessed and this will happen and, you know, trying to talk God into my situation. And God says, no, 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 I want you to come humbly. When you come under my leadership and my authority, recognizing your position and yes, you have the name of Jesus. Yes, you have the authority of God upon your life. Yes, you are an ambassador. Yes, you are all those things. But remember that you are not all that. Remember that he is all that. And you come in humble submission to his authority. Now, all of a sudden, Jesus defines that as great faith. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Now, let's read on. Let's read on. Verse number 11, and I say to you that many will come from the east and the west to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven. See, there's a rule and a reign in the kingdom. There's an authority structure in the kingdom. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, he's talking about the Jewish people at that time who thought that they were all that, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, right, all these different people who lifted themselves up and were in pride. He says they're going to get cast out. Why? Because they didn't humble themselves. Verse 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, what's that word right there? Oh, once again, you can't say it just kind of casually. All right, I think we've been over this, right? What is that word right there? Go. Go. So Jesus gives a command now. Jesus realizes this guy is submitted to my authority, and I don't have to come under his roof. He understands something. He's got great faith. He's got a humble faith. He's approached me, and now look at what he does. He gives the command, go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Didn't have to talk Jesus into it. Just had to have a humble, great faith. Hallelujah. Living examples of how humility works. Number one, Jacob, he recognized his personal value. Number two, the centurion recognized his position, his authority. Final thing for today, final example that we're going to take a look at is King Saul. King Saul recognizes his size. King Saul, he recognizes his size. Now, you and I, in comparison to God, we all would know that we're not that big. In fact, when you think about God, the earth is his footstool, the Bible says. So how big is your God? When you think about God kicking back, and putting his feet up on the earth, wow, he's huge. But let's go a little bit bigger than that because God's not just that big. He's even bigger than that. And the Bible tells us that God stretched out the expanse of the heavens. God stretched out and, and pulled it out and opened it up. What is that? The universe. And if you followed any of the Hubble telescope images lately and seen how many galaxies there are, my goodness, God is bigger than galaxies. God is bigger than the universe. God stretched all that out. Wow, how big is your God? Now, bring your eyes back down and take a look here. And all of a sudden, you realize how small you are, how finite you are, how little you are. King Saul had the same approach in his heart. 
Here, the nation of Israel had desired a king, and so they had asked God for a king, and God says, fine, I'll give you what you want. Here you go. So through a series of events, the prophet Samuel, the representative of God at that time, uh, meets up with Saul. Saul was looking for some donkeys. He came from a, a wealthy family, and so they had some, some donkeys that had ran off. He was looking for them and couldn't find them. So Samuel approaches him and says, hey, you still looking for the donkeys? Don't worry about that, okay? Because now all eyes are off the donkeys. They've been found. They're fine. But now all eyes are on you. If you want to turn there with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 9 in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter number 9. Samuel just got done saying, your donkeys that were lost three days ago, don't be anxious. They've been found. He says, on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on your father's house? In other words, Saul, you're it, man. All eyes are on you. Everybody's watching. Look at Saul's response. Look at what he says in 1 Samuel chapter number 9, verse number 21. 1 Samuel chapter number 9. Verse number 21, it says, And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? Now think about what he's saying for a moment. If you, if you study the nation of Israel, you know that there were 12 tribes. And of those 12 tribes, the smallest tribe was Benjamin. Benjamin, in fact, got lumped in with Judah eventually. It was so small, just got part of the southern tribes there, and, and, and it was this little teeny tiny tribe there right next to Judah. And so here's Saul. He's a Benjamite, right? Comes from the tribe of Benjamin. But not only that, not only does he come from the smallest tribe, he comes from the smallest family in the smallest tribe. And so when all eyes suddenly were focused on him as if he were something, he looks at himself and he says, wait a second, am I not from the smallest tribe of the smallest family? Why are you talking to me like this? And we see the heart of this man that at the beginning of his story, that he had a double dose of small in there. That it wasn't about how great he was because actually when, when they finally anoint him king, he stands up in front of the people and he was a head taller than everybody else. So in his physical stature, he could have been prideful. He could have said, of course I'm king. Look how tall I am. Look how cool I am. Look how big I am compared. I should be ruling all these people. And yet he didn't. He had a heart of humility. Why, why would you speak to me like this? I'm the smallest tribe and the smallest family. Now, I wish I could say that he continued on that road of humility, but he didn't. We see that he ended up on the road of pride and didn't do what the Lord asked him to do. There were some little things that he didn't take care of. He had small in his heart, but when he became king, he started to get off that and started to exalt himself and get big in his heart. Rather than submitting himself to God and doing what God asked him to do, he started to exalt himself in pride and do things his way. Thought he had done the will of the Lord, but he did the will of the Lord his own way and ended up destroyed. His family ended up destroyed. Ended up, he was supposed to fight a victory. and He was supposed to wipe out, completely wipe out all the people, wipe out all the animals. And Samuel approaches him and says, hey, 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 what's this bleeding of sheep in my ears? See, there was a little thing he was supposed to take care of completely wiping everything out, and yet he didn't do it. And he was rejected as king because of it. There was another time he was supposed to wait for Samuel to come before he made a sacrifice. Well, Samuel tarried. He was taking a long time. And so Saul got impatient. And instead of just doing one little thing, waiting, he goes ahead and does the sacrifice himself. And God comes and rebukes him through the prophet Samuel, and he says, is not the sin of rebellion as witchcraft. He says, you've rebelled against the Lord. You've been so prideful, so lifted up, so elevated in your own eyes. Now God has torn the kingdom from you. He says, he would have set up your kingdom forever. See, he would have exalted you, Saul, but now that haughty spirit has brought you down. And so you and I need to take the warning and, and see where the road goes. Make sure that we end up on the right road so that we get to the right destination. Like what D.L. Moody said, he said, there are many of us that are willing to do great things for the Lord, but few of us are willing to do the little things. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine, church. We need to make sure that we humble ourselves and we do what God has asked us to do in every area. Big things, yes, but little things. Living examples of how humility works so that we can get on the right road. Number one was Jacob, recognized his personal value. Number two is the centurion, recognized his position, his authority. And final one for today was King Saul, recognized his size. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, let's give God a great big praise. Hallelujah.
Before we leave, I just want to tell you guys, you've been great today. I really believe that God got a hold of you and got something in your heart. I believe that you received that and really got something from the word of the Lord. Let's not stop there. I want to make sure that before you leave this place, that if you died, that you wouldn't end up in hell, but that you'd go to heaven. Sometimes people hear that and they say, well, you know, I don't believe in hell. And therefore, I'm not going to go there. Well, did you know that just by denying hell's existence doesn't make it any less real? It's like saying, I don't believe in Mack trucks. Go stand on the slow lane of the freeway. Eventually, you'll meet one face to face. Just because you bury your head in the sand and deny its existence doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to deal with it. So let's deal with it today. Let's deal with it right now while you still have time. The Bible speaks of hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus talked about it, so it's a very real place. And I don't want you to go there. You don't want to go there. Most of all, God doesn't want you to go there. It's never designed for you and I. It was designed for the devil and his angels that rebelled. So how do we get to heaven? What's the path? What's the road like we were talking about? What's, what's the way to get there? Well, Jesus came and he said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What's that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. I'm not going to get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. And so what is God's way to heaven? A lot of times people think it's just by being good. Be good enough and God will let you into heaven. God lets good people into heaven. problem with that thinking is, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say how good you have to be? No grading scale in the Bible, no curve, no line that you have to be above. Be this good and you get to go to heaven. Why? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. I'm not going to make it there by being good. Sometimes people think, well, God's way is you're raised in church and parents tell you you're a Christian growing up. Go to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, be born in America. America's a Christian nation. And we're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. But again, the problem with that thinking is, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, or because you're born in America, or you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven, denying hell. It doesn't work like that. Come on today, let's not play games. Let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. You're not going to make it. Today, you need to listen up. Sometimes people think, well, you know what? Uh, not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church today, Pastor. I'm sitting right here in front of you. It's great. I'm glad you're here today, but show that to me in the Bible. If you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. That's like saying I could go to the ocean, sit in the water, call myself a fish, and that makes me a fish. Not going to happen. Just a wet human sitting there, right? Can't sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, well, wait a second, wait a second. My last church, I, I got involved. I helped out. I carried the pastor's Bible, sang in the choir, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. Even got a membership card to that church, taught in the Bible classes. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible, would you? Where church involvement gets you into heaven. Help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, sing in the choir. People think of you as a leader. Teaching the Bible classes, that gets you in heaven. It doesn't work. God is not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Come on. Come on today. Let's talk about your life. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I understand that. But, you know, I know God. I know about Easter and celebrate Christmas every year of my life, sing the songs. Could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament, tell stories out of the Bible. I mean, I knew about Saul and the centurion and, and, and Jacob. I could have told you all those stories myself. That's great. I'm glad you could do those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven, having head knowledge about who Jesus is? In fact, if you read your Bible, you would know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible records that the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scriptures, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that qualifies you for heaven. But rather, this is about your heart. There was a religious leader of Jesus' day that came to Jesus and was talking to him about the same subject. How do we get to heaven? Jesus didn't tell him, hey, you're a religious leader. You've done a lot of good. You've memorized scripture. You've gotten involved. You could quote scripture. You could sing scripture. I mean, this guy was probably better than everybody in this room. And yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. What does he say? He says, if you want to go to heaven, you must be born again. Now, a lot of times people cringe at that phrase being born again they say oh that's weirdo that's radical that's crazy and i've seen that in movies and television and books i don't want that listen 
It's not about what movies, televisions, books, society, doesn't matter what they say about it. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. All or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, third chapter. Jesus is speaking to the church, just like he's speaking to us in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang, just like that. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Wait a second. You're going to point and count? I might be embarrassed if you do that. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. But get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Come on probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down. Hey, how easy, how cool. And yet he says, if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your, your life? I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job, sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? And will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God. Finally, who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never surrendered all your heart and life to Jesus Christ? Come on, you can do that for the first time in this place today. Hands are already getting ready to go up. Let's do it all together. I'm going to count to three. All across the auditorium, back in the family room. If you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, raise your hand right where you're at. God's watching. Then you can tell an usher right afterwards, come into the church service, or if you're online, click the button that says respond to God. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high for me. Raise them up high. I'm going to start on this side. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. There's four. Thank you. Where are you at? Just wave. Give me a little wave if that's you. Thank you. Four, five. Got you. Five. Thank you. Six, seven. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Seven. Where are you at? Eight. Got you up there. Nine up on top. Thank you. God bless you. Ten. Thank you. Eleven right there. Thank you. God bless you. Eleven wise people already up on, up, out in the foyer. All right. Eleven. How many are back there? Two more, 11, 12, okay. Anybody else real quick? There's a dozen wise people up top, 13, gotcha. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? There's 13 wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Where you at? Where you at? Up top, 13, 14, thank you. God bless you. Gotcha. Anybody else real quick? 14, where you at number 15? You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. You should do this. Come on, go for it. If you know God's tugging at your heart right now, come on. Let's humble ourselves and do this God's way. Anybody else real quick? Number 15, come on. Just when I'm looking in your direction, pop it up at me. Anybody else real quick? Where you at, number 15? Come on. Come on, just put your hand up right where you're at. Number 15. Number 15. Anybody else real quick? Number 15. Everybody's pointing this way, so I'll turn back this way. Maybe I missed them. Where you at? Gotcha, number 15. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. (laughs) Woo! Now listen. Spirit of God just spoke to me. There's five more of you, a total of 20, that need to give your heart and life to Jesus. Don't get saved by raising your hand. Get saved when you pray and invite Jesus into your heart. We want to lead you in a prayer. We want to change destinies with you today, but we can't do that until we get you down here. So in a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to sing a song. As we do that, if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, hey, it's not too late. Once you get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church, once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, okay, because we're going to do that with you today. Lead you in a prayer. It's easy, and you need to do it, okay? So let's all stand. No one leaves during this time. Let them come. If you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Here's my heart, Lord, it, seal it, seal it for Hallelujah. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come.
Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. From the foyer. From the family rooms. Come on. Bring your kids. They'll remember this. It's okay. Come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on. Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to give you guys some instructions while I do that. If anybody else still needs to come, you just make your way to the front. You don't need to clap for them. Just let them come, all right? Hey, everybody up front. Thank God you guys have come. You can put a big smile on your face. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing, okay? When I introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right your left, this is Pastor Dave waving at you. He's a really good guy. Hey, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you've gotten past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to get today. He's cool. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? You're going to be born again. Then he's going to give you some free stuff, some free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Basically, it's a friend in church who will come alongside you for a couple of weeks and help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy. It's free. He'll describe how it works. Now, listen, if you give us one year of your life here at this church, I promise you that after this year and for the rest of your life, you'll be blown away by what God does in your life by simply submitting to the word of God. Now you say, well, but I got my own church. Well, at your own church, did you get saved? Because if you would have died there, you'd have ended up in hell. Obviously, God tugged on your heart here in this church today and you responded to him. So I would suggest, I'm putting in my application, we want to be your pastors here. We want to love you. We want to encourage you. We want to pour the word of God into you. Okay? Give us a year and watch what God will do in your life. You guys make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right this way. Just give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah!